organizations across the world represented here. Uh, everybody has to say okay to record. So we, uh, we're going to talk nonfiction today, and we've got a panel of folks who are uh, coming at this from a few different directions, all, all with Missouri ties here. Uh, and I'm going to go through, I'm going to introduce to each one. Uh, I will say, you know, keep your questions. If you have some questions, we'll have plenty of time at the end to be able to get to those. Uh, hopefully, I'll ask a lot of the questions you care about, but can never think of everything and want to hear from all of you. So I'm going to read this so I don't uh, make any mistakes here. So in alphabetical order, so Catherine Hoffman uh, is joining us from Kansas City. She's a Dallas native and a graduate of the Jonathan B. Murray Center for Documentary Journalism, yay, at the University of Missouri. Uh, during her time at Mizzou, she directed the documentary short 46 years, which just finished a year-long festival run. She's currently a multimedia reporter for Kansas City PBS, where she produces documentary style shorts, both in front of and behind the camera. She reports at PBS in cooperation with the program Report for America, a great program if you haven't heard of that, which is working to strengthen local reporting across the country. Um, Sharon Lease uh, is here from also from Kansas City. Uh, she founded Horizon uh, Productions there in Overland Park. She's a critically acclaimed and award-winning filmmaker who directs and produces documentary projects that have aired on major television networks and at many prestigious film festivals. Uh, Sharon's award-winning feature documentary, Transhood, premiered on HBO in November of last year. Uh, it won several awards, including the Audience Award for Best Feature Documentary at AFI Docs in Washington. Uh, Sharon created and executive produced Pink Collar Crimes, a true story, uh, a true crime series for PBS. Uh, her sh short documentary, Fight for the First, follows students at the Columbia Missourian, uh, premiered at Chuck Todd's Meet the Press Film Festival up in DC. Uh, and Sharon also directed and produced a, a personal favorite of mine, The Gnomist, a 20 minute short documentary about the power of kindness. And it had its world premiere at the 2015 Tribeca Film Festival and went on to win 15 festival awards, including the Jury Award for Best Short Documentary at LA Shorts Fest. Uh, she's currently completing a short doc about the largest American flag factory in the country that employs mostly refugees and immigrants. It will air on Nat Geo uh, next year. Uh, Brock Williams uh, is here. He is uh, from Los Angeles, so extending our um, time zone reach here. Uh, he's an Independent Spirit Award nominated and Academy shortlisted producer, line producer and editor working in both documentaries and scripted. So we've got that crossover covered. He was a film independent producing lab fellow in 2014 and became a producer in residence for Film Independent in 2018. Brock has produced critically acclaimed feature documentaries such as On Her Shoulders and Killing Them Safely, as well as scripted films including Slash, Awful Nice, and Box Elder. He was a co-producer of Your uh, Next. He's produced several award-winning short films as well, including Freeze and 92 Skybox Alonzo Morning Rookie Card. And finally, uh, Chelsea Myers Wright is a Columbia filmmaker, animator, and visual storyteller. And she's the founder of the Tiny Attic Artist Collective. She believes every project deserves a unique vision and team of passionate creatives. She fills the role of director, producer, editor, illustrator, cinematographer, and animator. Her lifelong pursuit of meaningful work led her into documentary filmmaking about subjects in environmental sustainability and social justice. So that's some formal um, biographies of everybody here, but I want to I want to start out as we kind of go around the group, and maybe we'll we'll talk about how you got started uh, on the nonfiction side of things, and and lead forward from there. So I think Sharon, maybe we'll start with you. You've got quite a a lengthy resume on the nonfiction side, and so how did you get interested in nonfiction to start with? Oh, you're muted. Rookie mistake, huh? <laughs> we all do it. Um, so I, um, I was um, in marketing and communications, and I had like an advertising firm, and um, and then I did marketing for several different organizations. And and with my with my uh, own company, I was finding that I was gravitating toward telling the stories of, especially of nonprofit organizations. And um, so that's where I got sort of into the social justice interest. And then storytelling, um, I was just really drawn to it and started doing working in the um, video space. And, um, and while I was doing that, an idea came to me as my daughter was going into high school that um, I could 
I could document, um, well, I wanted to document her, but that didn't work out. So it was uh, 12 of her contemporaries at high school and I followed them for four years. So I followed 12 girls going through high school in Overland Park, Kansas uh, for all four years of their high school experience. Um, and then uh, basically had at that time a box of tape and uh, went out to LA and got an agent. And um, I mean, it, it was a real Cinderella story for me because I then got three offers from three different studios and went with New Line. And then we sold it first to MTV and then sold it to, and then they decided they wanted to do something different with it. So we killed that deal and then went on to WeTV as eight episodes. And then WeTV asked me to do it again in another city. And I did it in Chicago for another four years. Um, so that's how I got my start. So let me, I'm going to stick with you just for a little bit, because that's, I think a lot of people listening would be like, that's exactly what I want to do. And so to, you know, that's great success. And to what do you attribute that, you know, out of the box success that, that came with that? Well, one thing I think it was naivete because I just thought I'll just do this and, um, I, and, and we'll see. And I look at the letter that I sent the parents when I first started doing it, it was like, maybe it'll be on PBS, maybe it'll be on HBO. You know, I don't, I mean, those are to totally mm -hmm. different tonal things that, you know, at the time I was like, oh, well, who knows where this is going to go. And then, um, and then I just think it's just determination and just, you have to contact so many people and just, uh, it's really a numbers game. I mean, I, I just think you, you have to, finding an agent is really it's hard it really is hard and it gets harder and harder now mm -hmm. um but um you know i actually was having a hard time getting an agent and then i started going out on my own to try to just reach out to studios and um i don't know if uh, some of you probably have heard of rj cutler i somehow got a hold of him and um and then i he had done american high and now he's gone on to do even a lot more things but um I got a hold of him and I got a meeting with him. So I was going to fly out to LA and I let my aide that one, the person I wanted to be my agent, I go, I was like, Hey, I'm going out to, um, I'm, I emailed him and said, I'm going out to LA cause I'm going to meet with RJ Cutler. And literally five minutes later, cause I had a fax machine at that time, <laughs> the contract with the agent came across the fax machine. So it's like, you just have to keep you keep, keep at it. And I know everybody says it and it just sounds trite, but it like, it really is what you need to do. You just need to keep contacting different people. And even though most people won't even respond to you or respond to an email, um, you just got to, that's, that's what you need to do is my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your company uh, now. So Horizon Productions, that's, we, if you say it out loud, but it's H-E-R, uh, Horizon. So, um, how many people, what, you know, what's the makeup of the company that you're working with now? Yeah, well, the reason it's called Horizon is because I do like to tell um, stories uh, about women. Um, I do like the coming of age stories, but I do tend to focus on, on uh, stories that are empow about empowered women and empowering for women. Um, and I sort of... Um, I have one person who works for me full time um, and she used, she used to live in Kansas City and now she's in Rochester, but we have that down and she's usually on all my projects. Um, and then I have, um, I, usually, I usually have a lot of interns uh, at times. Um, over COVID, it was really hard, but right now I have two, I have two interns and, um, and then I staff up and gear up depending on, on the project. And so it's, yep. sort of, you know, accordion. We're going to talk to everybody about finding crew and, you know, kind of expanding and accordioning uh, to what you need here, but we'll circle back around on that. Chelsea, let's uh, slide over to you and talk a little bit about how you got into uh, the nonfiction side of things. I'm particularly interested to talk about animation too, but let's, let's start at the beginning. Uh, I guess it all kind of weaves together. Um, I, since I was eight years old, I, I knew I wanted to be a storyteller. I thought I was a journalist. Uh, at that time. And so I went to MU for journalism, uh, realized I was much more interested in, in long form uh, creative storytelling, still in a nonfiction realm. So I started a documentary film production company. We focused on mostly doing uh, grant funded documentaries in the beginning. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I wove my way into making a sustainable career, but also doing my own independent side projects as well. 
Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about Tiny Attic now and, and you know, who makes it up? You're, you call it a, a collective of, of creatives. So who's on the team and how did all of you come together? Well, my main uh, collaborator is Aaron Phillips, who um, is an amazing DP. Uh, we, I can't even remember how we met. Uh, it's been <laughs> such a wild ride, but um, him and I usually go out with a small crew when we make our documentaries. Uh, Tiny Attic, part of our nature is keep it tiny. We really appreciate the smaller edge of documentary production where it's more intimate feel of a smaller crew. Um, sometimes our subjects are incredibly vulnerable. Uh, I had to uh, basically be my entire crew on a shoot in Uganda because of the sensitivity of the subject matter with teenage girls who had come out of sex trafficking and um, I think I'm more comfortable working in that more one-on-one -on -one experience with my subjects, but I always have a sound person. So Tim Pilcher has been that for me as well. Um, my husband, Josh, he works on my film sets usually as a field producer, sometimes second camera. And uh, then the animation side's a whole other side. I work with artists all over the United States, pulling off various animations, both in documentary and in fiction. Yeah, well, let's talk talk just a little bit about animation while we have it on the table here, because I think some some people have seen your work with True False, the uh, daily bumpers, I guess whatever we call those there, and you've done those uh, recently. But what what led you to doing animation on particularly on the nonfiction side? I always wanted to get into animation in nonfiction since I was at MU. Uh, I actually tried to set up a collaboration between the IT department, which is where I was learning some of my animation skills at and the journalism program, because there are so many stories, as we know, that don't have footage or the ability to capture footage to tell a story, whether that's an archival story or it's a very sensitive subject where you might want to, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm working with um, uh, a war hero right now trying to figure out how to pull off some more, more violent imagery, uh, sensitive, shocking matter uh, from his experience over in Afghanistan. So um, documentary, uh, animation for me has always been a tool in, in my giant kit of what, how do we tell the story the best? What's the best avenue to really relay the subject matter? How do I, we engage our audience without you know, shocking them so they stick with the story? Um, and then also I, I've done animation with uh, the homeless population just because of a lack of footage of their stories, their narratives. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll, we'll probably come back and circle around on that a little bit more, but let me uh, go on with the group here. Uh, so Brock, out in LA, uh, bright and early, thank you for getting up for this. Uh, let's talk yeah. about your your roots in the business here and how you got started. Well, um, I, I think I got into nonfiction storytelling because of the accessibility of it. I, um, I lived in Columbia, Missouri for a very long time. And, and while I was working there, I, I felt like uh, in order to sustain like a freelance film and video career. And I had, a, and I started a small production company, Boxcar Films, and was there for a long time. Um, but to keep working, I felt like I, I needed to sort of have a broad um, a breadth of experience in different, in different parts of filmmaking. So I was shoot, getting some jobs as a camera operator and some jobs as an editor and, and working as an AD and working as a field producer and just kind of taking on a lot of different things. And because of that, I started um, just filming stories that I found interesting and I made several short documentaries. And then I worked in some fiction films. I produced three fiction features in um, Missouri and then met uh, my first feature documentary was Killing Them Safely, the taser documentary, which you were involved in some, Stacey, but met Nick Berardini, who had been in the middle of making that film and needed support and help to try to get it finished and kind of a plan. And my experience at that point had been making a few scripted features and playing a lot of festivals and, and getting distribution and, and release and all of that. So I started helping Nick uh, partly with the kind of hands-on, like we went out, I raised some money for that. We went out and filmed several more interviews and um, I was operating the camera for the interviews. We we're keeping it as small as possible because it was all very, um, it was very low budget mm -hmm. at the time until we had a lot of footage in the can and we were able to make a, a 
teaser that we were able to take around and get a sales agent and raise more money and finish the movie. So, but at first we were doing everything kind of ourselves. So filmed um, and edited a version of that film. And then we, we were able to raise money and get, bring on polished editors and get that finished. And that film premiered at Tribeca in 2015. And then the other feature documentary that I was a producer on after that was On Her Shoulders. And that one came about because um, I met Alexandria Bombach, the director of that film at True False years ago, which is actually where a lot of my connections in the documentary film industry have come from. It's people that I've met at True False over the years. Um, but I met Alexandria and she had just been hired by this production company to go and make that film and wanted to bring me on. We knew each other for a couple of years when On Her Shoulders came about and she reached out to me to come on and be a producer on that film. So that's how you might You might on. mention what that's about. It is that the other feature you mentioned is about tasers, but the On Her Shoulders. Right. On Her Shoulders is about Nadia Murad. She won the um, Nobel Peace Prize in 2018. Yes, I believe. Um, she is a Yazidi survivor. She was um, the Yazidis, for people who don't know, are in the Middle East and they faced a genocide at the hands of ISIS. And Nadia was, well, her family was um, was killed and she was taken as a, as a slave and escaped. And she became the most famous um, survivor of the Yazidis and ended up on this whirlwind kind of press tour, speaking at the UN and speaking around the world. Um, uh, and trying to bring awareness to what was happening to the Yazidis. So that's that was that story. That film premiered at Sundance in 2018. And Alexandria uh, won the directing award at Sundance for that film. Um, yeah, very yeah. well received. Uh, so talk about the move to Los Angeles. So you had eventually decided to uh, move your home base out of Missouri to Los Angeles. What was the decision there? I came out to LA, I started traveling a lot in like 2010. I came out to LA for a few months in 2010 and I worked a job out here and I, for about eight years, I guess I bounced around. I, I had an apartment in Columbia, Missouri and that was sort of my home base, but I would come to LA for jobs and be here for months at a time. And I would go to Austin. I started working a lot in Austin and I produced a film in Austin and was there for about a year. Um, through pre-production and production and post. And we did all of that in Austin. So I kind of bounced around, but kept my place in Missouri for a long time. And just about three years ago, I decided to kind of make the official move out here. I just found myself out here more and more and more. For the last two years that I had my place in Missouri, I was in LA at like 10 months out of the year. Mm. And so my, my address was there and I was there for a couple of months at a time, but I was out here more and more and more and just decided to kind of be out here. I found at a certain point in my career that what, what, what was happening is that I would go to Missouri when I was in between projects or when I was making projects in Missouri, which I love to do and, and still try to do. Um, but when I was in between projects, I would go to Missouri because that was my home. And I was starting to find that it was easier for me to find more work if I was in LA, as, as hard as it is logistically to, to live in LA and cost-wise, um, I was starting to find that it was easier for me to get work just by being here and being around people that were here in LA. So, but I still travel a lot and still come back to Missouri for projects. And, and Yeah, I think we'll all talk about sort of the nonfiction landscape in Missouri in a second. One other question, well, at this point, Brock was, Talk a little bit about your balance between fiction and nonfiction. Um, you, you still, I guess, are bouncing back and forth. And so mm -hmm. there's something you like better about one or the other or something, you know, what, what's I, the difference you for work? I don't know. I, I, I just like um, storytelling, I think. But I also kind of like unique challenges. I've just always been a person who um, it gets bored easily and likes to be challenged. And so... Um, I find that there are just different challenges with each process. And after doing one, um, it's sort of just worked out this way, but maybe there's some part of it that's kind of deliberate on my part, but I've kind of gone back and forth like one feature film to the next almost in the last several years. And I think there's something about um, finishing a project that then I've kind of been itching to do the other thing. Um, so like when I am, uh, 
when I finish a documentary, I'm often like, it's, I mean, it's very hard making a feature film, both documentary and scripted films. And so I find when I get done with one that I'm kind of like, I want to do the other one again. <laughs> and I just sort of go back and forth. But um, yeah, I don't really have a, the other thing that I have found that I'll mention is there's a certain point in the process. I think starting a documentary and starting a scripted film are very, very different, but there's a certain point in the middle of making a film where they kind of converge. And there's a point somewhere in the middle where it just becomes a film. Mm -hmm. And from there to the end, it's kind of the same process, um, which I think is interesting. I also think I just um, love films and storytelling. And I don't, I feel like some of the distinction is unnecessary, like the lines that people draw, right. which is one of the things I love about true false and kind of the ethos behind it. But I, I think the, um, yeah, I just, I think that the, the there do, don't need to be these uh, borders all the time or categories necessarily. We had uh, Spike Lee on campus a number of years ago and he said basically the same thing because somebody asked about his, his bouncing back and forth between fiction and nonfiction and his, his answer was basically the same. He just said, the, you know, the lines are too artificial in terms of production and what it takes to get things done. Uh, I, I will mention a, a couple of us have mentioned True False and uh, I, I shouldn't assume that everybody knows what that is, but the True False Film Fest is in um, Columbia each year, typically in March, uh, and it's a documentary film festival, one of the most important ones in the world, frankly, and so lucky to have it in Missouri. And so a lot of us have have connections with that, either you know, attending it or having films played there. Uh, Kat, on to you here. And so uh, you, you might be sitting there, others might be saying is like, her job is different than these other people, but that's by design. I wanted to bring you in uh, to talk about that because I think for a lot of folks on the production side, it's a little um, scary to go out and, and start their own production companies as all of these folks have done. And so you are, you don't have your own production company. You work for an employer. Yes. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about how you got there, why you decided to do that and what you're doing there. Well, my story will be quite short because I'm pretty early in my career. So um, I'm way more excited to be here listening to you all <laughs> than to talk. Um, but yeah, so I have always wanted to get into production. My parents used to have a little production company and they would bring me on set sometimes. And I thought it was like the most thrilling thing in the world to write time codes. Um, so I always wanted to get into production. I got really passionate about nonfiction, um, mostly through social justice. Um, and thought that it was such an amazing way to build empathy uh, in people, uh, which I think we just need a lot more of. And right around that time, I uh, was getting interested in nonfiction. The Murray Center for Documentary Journalism was starting up at the University of Missouri, and it was just the perfect fit. And so that's where I went. Um, I interned at Kansas City PBS and our, our digital magazine Flatland while I was there, which it's actually thanks to Stacy. So my whole career, thanks to you. Um, and I, that's where I went after I graduated. And so I really love Kansas City PBS. I loved the idea of having the freedom of freelance. Um, you know, obviously a lot of people in my cohort were off to New York or LA after we graduated. Um, I love I love uh, the reasonable price of living here in Missouri. And there's also a lot of stories to be told here in Missouri. So um, I decided to stay and PBS has so many great opportunities uh, for nonfiction storytelling. Um, I love that we bring in a lot of filmmakers. Uh, and so technically I am a reporter. And so I'm turning basically nonfiction shorts every week. Um, but then I also get to work on other films. And so it's kind of a, a nice blend. Um, and I cover communities and culture here in Kansas City. So it's a really, really broad, um, broad swath that I, I get to cover locally. Yeah, and yeah, so- what, well, Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. What's sort of the, the time frame? What's the schedule you're working on? Do you turn some things around quickly and then have longer, longer runs for other things? Yeah, um, it's really, it's really, really, really flexible. So sometimes I, you know, turn a, a quick story that's written in three days because um, it needs to happen. But most of the time I am doing video anywhere from one to three weeks I can take on a piece, um, but I try to have something um, that I can show every week 
Um, but yeah, it's really flexible. Uh, and so I do in front of the camera, behind the camera, written, um, just multimedia. Uh, and it's probably worth, I mentioned it in your introduction, but Report for America, the people mm -hmm. uh, watching might be familiar with Teach for America and it's, it's built on the same platform really, but you wanna talk about what Report for America is? Yeah, so uh, Report for America is the, the program basically that I do this through. Um, it's really similar to Teach for America, but for reporters and storytellers. So it's really trying to uh, vamp up uh, local journalism all over the country and now all over the world. They just expanded, but uh, it's same principle. So they take reporters and place them in local newsrooms around the U.S. Uh, to cover uh, underserved communities and topics that need attention um, in that local area. And so the idea is that, you know, everything starts local. Um, so kind of really building up that, that local reporting. So that's why I cover um, underserved communities in Kansas City specifically through that program. Um, and part of, part of the cost of that, the part of your salary comes from the program. So it helps um, organizations that might not be able to afford to hire somebody to cover yeah. that, right? To be able mm -hmm. to yeah, so a lot of a lot of smaller papers, smaller newsrooms, um, smaller productions can afford to have somebody on to to look at stories that need to be looked at in their community that they might not have had money to do before. Um, and then I didn't mention so my film forty six years that I directed while I was at the Murray Center um, has been a really fun ride. Um, it's about the unsolved murder of my grandfather, um, and through those festivals, I've gotten to meet some really cool people um, in Kansas City and St. Louis um, and introduced me to Next Stock, which is a really cool uh, filmmaking fellowship in New York for young filmmakers of color. Um, so yeah, that's been, it's been fun. So thanks to the Murray Center for, for that opportunity. Yeah, you're from Texas, but you're, you ended up, your, your short was uh, St. Louis and Kansas City based. So you got to, got to see a good chunk of the state putting that together. Yeah. Well, let me, let me sort of throw out there for everybody. I'm interested in just your perceptions of the, the nonfiction landscape in Missouri right now. Um, is it a, a good time to be making nonfiction there? Is it a tough time? And I know we've, we've dealt with COVID over the last 18 months or so, but uh, are we coming out of that? So I don't know if anybody has a, an opinion about that first. And I know, you know not all of you do all of your work in Missouri. I don't think any of you uh, do all of your work in Missouri, but you're working here some, and so I'm interested to see what you think that landscape is like now. Well, I could go. I I, um, I think it's incredible. <laughs> I just think there's so many, well, there's so many stories in the world. There's so many stories in the country. And if you just, you know, zero in on one area, you can find so many so many stories there. And I, um, there was just an article in the Kansas City Star two days ago about, um, about films and television series that are sort of set in Kansas City or have, be, and it was all, it was about Ted Lasso, basically. I mean, that was the whole story because there's so many Kansas City ties to it. But then um, they did mention um, my, my projects and I guess I hadn't counted them up, but I have like, four projects that came from Kansas, from Kansas City. So it was like, yeah, cause I do stuff all, all over the country, but it was, um, it was really kind of fascinating and rewarding to know that it really can happen right in your backyard. Um, and the Nomis that you mentioned earlier, I mean, that literally is my backyard. I mean, it, you could walk to where, to where it was. So, I mean, I'm developing several projects. I'm, I'm actually shooting uh, a sizzle on Monday um, about for uh, in Kansas City um, about the grooming project, um, which is this really incredible program where they teach. Um, it's a jobs training program for um, mostly homeless women, uh, women who um, are below the poverty line um, to teach them how to groom dogs. And when the, and they go from zero to making 35 to $45,000 a, a year in six months because um, they're guaranteed job placement. So it's, it's like, you know, you see a program like that, it's in Kansas City and why not? So um, I, I just think there's, and I always see people coming in for, I mean, like Queer Eye comes in and does all this stuff. And I'm like, man, they found some stuff, you know, and I'm always surprised. I'm like, why didn't I hear about that? You know, and it's right <laughs> here. So um, I think there's tons of stories to be told here. And, and there's a lot of beautiful 
uh, landscape and neighborhoods and areas um, to, to tell the stories into and to have really cinematic um, footage. Do you find that when you're, you know, looking for a new project, do you sort of look close to home just because of the economy of not having to travel first, just yes. to be able to do something? Yes. Yeah. I, and it's uh, because when I did Transhood, um, it was so much easier than for, you know, we all know for documentary, if you have to do appointment shooting, it, you're, you sometimes miss things. Mm -hmm. And by living here in Kansas City for, for transit, it could be like, oh, this is happening today. And not, I couldn't always get a crew together, but I also had a camera and could, could shoot sometimes. I mean, there's a tiny bit of it in the film, but because that's not, that's not my forte, but, um, but, you know, at least I'm, I'm here and I can try to, um, you know, mobilize really quickly. So I think that, I, yeah, I, I like to look here first. I agree Those with me. that sentiment. Yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead. I, I've been working on a film for uh, almost six years now on a woman that lives here in Columbia, Missouri, my, my hometown. And she is an amazing human being, but she does not let me know things are happening until the day of typically. So I'm very grateful that I only have a 20 minute drive typically to go and, and capture these important moments in her life. Um, the film's about her becoming a mother. I started filming when she was pregnant. And so often things arise where she's just like, oh, I didn't think about this, but this is like an incredibly important moment in my daughter and I's life. And I'm like, okay, yeah, great. It totally is. I'll be right there. <laughs> um, That's amazing. That's me. That sounds it, amazing. It's gonna be, uh, yeah, it's, it's really unique too because uh, she runs an experimental theater company. So it's about her becoming a mother and in association with her losing or re-navigating her identity as an artist through this process and, and what independence means after you've kind of lost that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a project you couldn't do if, it, if this person was in Minnesota or something, you just wouldn't have the access to get there. To, to do it over six years plus. And it absolutely evolved naturally. I was filming her uh, originally for her theater company. She asked me to come and document some productions. I got to know her. We established a, a friendship and a trust. And uh, while she was pregnant, she was going through some, um, you know, of the, I, I assume I'm not a mother, but some of the typical uh, scary motherhood transitional phases of, is this like really what I want to do with my life? And how do I, um, you know, work this into my art? And it felt like the camera was a, a little bit of a tool for her processing that. And I actually dropped the project for, I believe four months, looked at the footage and I was like, actually there's something here. And we picked it right back up. Mm -hmm. Wow. So Brock, you're, um... You you know, killing them safely was a Missouri story, at least at the heart of that. Uh, it went broader mm -hmm. than that, but it was a Missouri story at the start. And uh, but on her shoulders, obviously, was an international uh, project. So, what do you see? Sort of the differences between working in Missouri, uh, particularly when you were here, versus being California based and and going all over. Um, I don't feel like there's a huge difference on bigger projects, like working on something like on her shoulders. Um, it didn't matter where I was based, you know, and I think that's true for a lot of projects where, you know, you're traveling and the story is happening elsewhere. But I think um, Killing Them Safely is a good example of, of what everyone's kind of touched on, which is these stories that are local or that are just around, like the stories are happening all the time around everyone. Yeah, and that so was an example. Give, yeah, yeah, give an example, give a little more detail on what that was about. Yeah, so it was an incident that happened in Moberly where um, a young man was pulled over by the police and he was tasered in the chest for 30 seconds and died. And um, Nick, the director of that film at the time was a, was a student at Mizzou and was working in um, the KOMU and was the first reporter kind of by chance was the first reporter on the scene that night and met the family and, and just started following them. Um, because the story was so wild. And he, he did several news packages kind of following up on what was happening with the story. And then when that kind of was, you know, out of the news cycle, he just started going and filming with them to, to, with this idea of making a documentary. But he had no idea how big the story would get. So he started making a documentary about this incident that happened to this kid in Moberly. 
And as he started digging deeper and deeper, he started to re realize, you know, he should interview this company that makes tasers and reached out to the company and navigated that over the course of a year or so and got an interview and went to, to Arizona and filmed with the folks at Taser International. And, um, and that interview kind of blew the story even bigger and it just kind of kept going. And that's around the time that I met Nick and he was trying to kind of figure out what he had and figure out how to, you know, make this into a bigger story. So we then spent months looking through all the footage that he had from the few interviews that he had and, and the time that he had spent with his family and, um, and starting to figure out what would be needed to tell this bigger story. And we planned a, a big kind of tour where we went and filmed all these interviews. And because we were early in our careers um, and didn't have access to a lot of money, we did this huge road trip. Um, we had all these interviews that we had identified up and down the West Coast. So we drove out to LA and then did this little tour. Nick and um, Jamie, the other producer and I, we did this little tour where we did interviews in San Diego and LA and San Francisco and Portland and Seattle and Vancouver. Spent about a week in Vancouver and then drove back down the coast and just like filmed all these interviews. And then came back to Missouri and then started like editing all the footage that we had. But it was a example, I think, of a story that, you know, just happened um, nearby. And in following and digging and peeling back the layers, it, it became this huge, you know, kind of expose on this company and the history of, of Taser International and their relationship to law enforcement and everything that uh, everything that that means. I'll, I'll take a look at some point here when, when I have a moment and see, you know, as we talk about some of these films and projects, if they're available streaming out there, I'll put a link or let people know where they're at so they can see those. That film was on uh, Netflix for a while, as I recall, but I don't know if it still is. Um, I think it's on Hulu now. Yeah. Or Hulu now? Okay. Yeah, some, some of you may know where you can say, rather than me looking up, you can say where people can see these. Uh, Kat, by uh, definition, you are telling stories in Missouri and Kansas, I assume. And so um, it's not so much a choice of, you know, whether you do it here, but I, I assume it's what you're trying to find. And so as you go out to tell these stories on these undercovered communities, are you, do you have trouble coming up with what you want to tell? Or are you finding plenty of stories? Yeah, um, I was going to say, I mean, when you're a local reporter, there's no choice but to find those local stories, um, which I love and I think is great. Um, you know, so much more than a flyover state. There's so much happening um, in Missouri and so many stories to tell. Um, and, it, you know, local storytellers can do it with so much more nuance than um, someone who's never been here before. Um, so I really enjoy that. Uh, it hasn't really been that difficult so far. I think once you get the ball rolling and once you have like a list of people, uh, you know, really embedded in the community, the stories just really keep coming. Um, and I think something that's really beautiful about it is that I was fully prepared for, uh, I don't know if hostile is the right word, but I was just, I was fully prepared for um, people to be much more hesitant about me coming into their lives and and telling their stories, but thus far, everybody that I've come in contact to has said, thank you so much for caring about what's going on out here. You know, like, th thanks for caring and wanting to tell these stories, which I think is is so great about, about being local. Let me ask you, you use the term flyover, and so I'll throw this out, ask, back out for everybody here, maybe, and maybe Sharon, have you start, but uh, when you approach people either, you know, on the West Coast or the East Coast, and you've got projects, you know, how are you perceived being from Missouri? I think they're so used to dealing with LA based or New York based companies. So is it harder because you're doing it from the Midwest? It's, oh, I have so much to say about this. Um, well, first of all, I, I grew up in upstate New York. So, um, so it's funny because I, I have that New York tie, but, um, but I feel a lot of pride and loyalty because I've been in the Midwest for several years, decades. Um, but so here's one, one of the things is that we've been doing these Zooms so much um, now and people will say, oh, so always oh, start out with, oh, are you in New York or are you in LA? Or like, they'll be, I'll be like, oh, you're in LA, Ohio, you know, oh, I was just there last week. Oh, they're, oh, you, so you're in New York, so you're New York based. And I'm like, no, there is that middle of the country. So it never, people never suspect or think. I mean, they really, it's very interesting. It's like you live on one of the coasts and then people are always like, well, how do you do it from there? And, um, 
And I've been doing, what's also interesting to me is that through the pandemic, people kind of been living what I help and working the way I always have. So um, I've done a lot of FaceTimes and a lot of, and I, and you know, you have a phone, you can do a lot of stuff and you don't have to be. And, and the biggest thing now is that you don't have to be in post in one, one spot. And I think people are realizing that, that they don't need, we don't need to have these, you don't have to be, just because you're doing post, it doesn't mean you all, all the editors have to be together. And I've actually, this past week had, past two weeks, I probably had five interviews to, for show running. And it's great because I'm not, I don't have all the anxiety of like, oh, well, can you be a local in New York or can you be in LA? It's like, yeah, you can do it wherever. And, and we're good with you, you know, putting your team together um, and it all being virtual. So, um, so I think that that has, that it has changed, even though the perception is like, you're, where are you? You're not in New York or LA. Do you think you've ever lost work because of it or, or for that matter, gained work because you were outside of those cities? Um, I think that people find it really fascinating. Like when, when, uh, when I took Transhood to HBO, they were, uh, they, they just all love like, wow, it's the middle of the country. And it's not, do, you know, you're not telling a story from, um, and they love the idea that you're, that you're embedded and that you live there. I mean, that, that I know with HBO, that was, that was definitely a plus that, um, that I was able to be here and I was telling the story from here. Um, you know, I think that people think that they're, I mean, and Missouri, it is different in, but there's also some things that are so similar that aren't, you know, it's, so it's not like that, that different, but people think like, oh, you know, access to like this exotic part of the, the country that, you know, nobody really knows. <laughs> uh, Brock, you already talked a little bit about why you moved. You were doing a lot of work uh, in Los Angeles. The, and you talked a little bit about the expense, you know, I'm thinking that you, your rent probably costs as much as the other four, four of us uh, put together, you know, on the differences there. But uh, what, since you made the move, obviously you've stayed, so you think it's been worth it, but any, uh, any connections back to Missouri that still pay off? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I um, try to come back to Missouri as often as I can. Um, and, and I still have connections and have work there occasionally. Um, I would love to shoot um, more scripted films in Missouri, but it's been difficult since there's with the tax credit, obviously. Um, but that is a goal of mine is to come back and shoot another scripted, produce another scripted feature in Missouri at some point. Um, I just love filming there. I, yeah, that's a whole other conversation, but filming, shooting scripted, I just line produced a feature that film that shot in LA in March. And it is remarkable the difference of uh, filming in a place like Missouri versus a place like Los Angeles. Like the difference between going to a location and having them say, we should, we filmed at a gas station here in LA and it was $14,000 for the mm -hmm. location fee to shoot for one day at a gas station. <laughs> and in Missouri, I just remember like going up to people and saying, can we film in your restaurant? And they're like, yeah, sure. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. They're like excited. <laughs> you know? um, so that's a that's an interesting difference. One thing I was going to say that Sharon mentioned is it, it. I I have also noticed that in the last two years, it's easier to be remote for people. I, and in some ways, I feel like if I were a little bit more ad, advanced in my career, I've seen people who are more like older and a little more successful and a little more advanced in their careers than I am leave LA in the last year or two because there's a certain point where nobody cares where you live they just want to work with you and um and especially now like sharon mentioned with um the way the technology has evolved and with the pandemic forcing everybody to go remote it's been interesting for me to see a lot of people that i was working with in la um have gone elsewhere but they're still you know everybody's just working uh, remotely anyway and it's become so much easier to do that so it's in terms of yeah post-production workflow and pre-production and all of these things it's kind of possible to do from anywhere now so that's been kind of interesting to see yeah you mentioned tax credits and I want to talk in a minute about tax credits and money and budgets and that sort of thing but uh, Chelsea what about you and so you're dealing with people all over the country and the world it sounds like is that easy for you from Missouri is it is it difficult 
I should mention, um, I often get hired as a DP on multiple documentary films uh, that are being produced in New York or LA. Um, and it's hilarious to me because someone gets my name through one of my associations in the Midwest. And it doesn't matter whether it's like Nebraska or Texas or Ohio, it's like a uh, Missouri filmmaker, that's close to you, right? I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> eight hour drive, but uh, fortunately growing up in the Midwest, we're all used to the road trip. So I tend to get like basically like a huge, like, you know, multi-statewide parameter of work because people are like, I don't want to, fly someone out or you know drive 26 hours from LA so uh that's been a really interesting um experience for me also because uh the footage that I bring back to them they're typically like oh wow I didn't think that's what the Midwest looked like <laughs> <laughs> like I constantly get asked to go places more rural which is hilarious to me they're like we thought it'd be like scrappier than that <laughs> like, <laughs> You should come out here sometime. It's a great place. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of interactions with with folks that uh, don't technically understand what the Midwest looks like, and it's it's really nice to have a Midwesterner, you know, approach people in um, you know our our way that's more friendly and less mm -hmm. like you know streamlined, geared towards getting a result as fast as you can. Uh, I had a producer get. Uh, antsy with me about a shoot that was taking a little longer and I was like you you don't understand I have to talk to these people for 45 minutes about their family before I can pick up the camera like it's just what we have to do <laughs> but um yeah I, I love being based in the Midwest when it comes to documentary work because I I do think that people are so excited to be able to share their stories on a much bigger platform and and have someone treat them like you know the stars they are in their own lives Mm -hmm. It's the I've had that same experience with people saying, "Well, you're really close to something that's 12 hours <laughs> away or whatever." And um, it's that old. Uh, I think it was the New Yorker magazine had uh, the map of the of the country from a New Yorker's part of view. That you know, basically everything between the Hudson River and Los Angeles was just this little bitty smear there that they didn't have any notion of. I think that that still holds true. Uh, well, let's let's talk about money a little bit. Um, Brock mentioned uh, tax credits, and one of the things that MoMA has lobbied for and worked on and does every year, and I think we're inching, inching it toward the goal line, is trying to get tax credits uh, for production in Missouri. I saw that last week, I guess it was, or the week before, California has a massive new uh, influx of tax credits out there to try to get production back from some of the things that have gone away, and we've seen everything that's happened in Georgia. So um, I won't ask if you favor the tax credits. I think everybody probably does. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, funding and where you're finding that for nonfiction projects. And I'll just, I'll sort of leave it as vague as that kind of see, because I imagine that's coming from a lot of different places. Uh, I can go first about, um, typically my work is grant funded. Um, it's usually a client that I got the opportunity to do a smaller project with. They liked the uh, the way that we worked together and the product we made. So they hit me up, you know, six months a year from then with an opportunity they found in a grant that has a media component in it. Um, and and so I do a lot of work with uh, agroforestry, agriculture, uh, sustainable ag, um, conservation efforts, uh, a lot of outdoors nature stuff um, because those individuals really have the opportunity and access to larger amounts of money to produce higher quality work um, in sharing information, especially. So uh, I have a documentary called Living Soil that's online for free on YouTube. I think we passed uh, uh, 2.5 million views recently. Um, it was completely created just to inform people about sustainable agriculture practices across the United States. Um, and that was grant funded. Okay. What other sources of money are there out there? It's, uh, Brock, go ahead. Yeah, my um, experience is all is is mostly through independent financing, um, and I've raised money for different projects. The thing, I guess, the way that I've approached feature documentaries is there's always a need to do some amount of work before there typically can be any money raised, unless it's a very very small amount of money. Um, 
but as the process goes on, it's yeah, it usually takes with feature documentaries in terms of independent financing, it usually takes a lot of like passion and working to get a lot of interviews filmed and a lot of a lot of the idea and the story put together. And then it becomes possible to raise money either from production companies or from independent or individual financiers. So like when we did the Taser documentary, a lot of interviews had been filmed and a lot of this had been put together. Then we raised money from some individuals who put in, it was like $40,000 between a couple of people. And that was like family members and people we knew well who were willing to kind of take a chance and put up some money um, as investors in this. And that allowed us to shoot all the rest of the interviews and spend some time editing and put together a compelling teaser that kind of told the arc of what the film was gonna be. And then that is what we were able to use to get a sales agent and start to go to production companies and start to get the, the financing for the whole film, which was mm -hmm. still not a very big budget for a feature film, but it was like $300,000 or something. Do you find um, it easier to get um, funding for nonfiction or fiction? It's hard for both. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I think the thing about nonfiction is you can raise money in chunks as you go along and as you're making it. So you can take, you can get $5,000 from somebody and say, okay, this will, you know, pay for me to go shoot some interviews and do something. And then you can take that and use that to raise a little bit more money to get to the next phase. And you can kind of do that. And that's something that you can't really do in, in scripted filmmaking. You could raise the money to, on a really small film, you could raise the money to get through production and then try to raise the money for post-production. Mm -hmm. um, but those are really the only kind of two phases in the scripted filmmaking. Whereas with nonfiction, you can, um, yeah, you can raise little chunks as you go and you can get to the point where as you get closer to the end, you can raise the rest of the money that you need to kind of finish. Right. So that's maybe the only difference. And so in that regard, it's kind of easier, you know, it's easier to get 10 grand from somebody than two million dollars or whatever so in that sense it's um maybe a little bit easier to go through the process on a documentary but yeah sharon let me ask you because with transhood you've got some of that sweet hbo money so how did that come about how did you how did you connect there something everybody would be envious of i think yeah, I mean, and I think most of it is the way I do it too. Is is the way Brock is describing a, a lot of it is you do the you have to make the the sizzle the trailer um, before, and that's like usually self funded. I mean, I've never had anyone fund fund that. Um, and with HBO, I mean, I I actually was um, working on the project for a year and a half for Transhood for a year and a half just. Um, uh, self-funding. Um, I also have people who um, I collaborate with a lot in Kansas City who are willing to do some things for me, um, knowing that I'm going to try to get this, get it sold, and that I uh, like kind of a deferred payment thing. So I was doing it for a year and a half until I then um, connected with John Murray of the Murray Center um, and at Buna Murray in LA. And he, um, and he said that he wanted to be, he wanted to, to, um, you know, co-produce this. So, um, that helped. And, um, and then we, and then we together went to HBO, but by the time we went to HBO, um, we had, sh I probably had shot three, three years worth, three, three and a half years. Um, and we were, and, and then we ultimately shot five years, but, um, so, you know, they saw that all this material was already, was, was already in the can. And so partly, uh, it was a very, um, um, we had a small budget from Buna Murray cause they, he, it was a passion project for, for John. So he wanted to fund it so it could get to a point where we could take it somewhere. And then, um, then, and then HBO, um, you know, and actually we were really lucky. Um, and this happens all the, I mean, it happens when you have a, when you have something like, I wish most projects would do this, like HBO, Netflix, uh, and Apple were vying for it. And it's like, can you take another project? 
<laughs> can I, you know, but then they're all not interested in other projects, but they're all interested in one project. So, um, but we, but we went with HBO, which I'm really happy we did, but that's how, um, and sometimes you can go straight to the distributor. Um, but sometimes you need, to, if you show that you've already had three, you have three and a half, um, you know, you've had three and a half years of footage, though I will say it was the, the three minute trailer that that sold it. They, they didn't even look at any more footage. They just knew that we had other footage um, when, when they bought it. But, um, but to the point of going directly to distributor like this film that I have now, it's a short um, on the American, uh, this American Flag Factory in Wisconsin. Um, Nat Geo did get that, did um, pick that up from a trailer. So we went and we shot once and um, it was a long shoot, several days. And then, um, and then we put a trailer together and National Geographic did um, decide to, to um, we got a licensing agreement with them. So we actually did need to still raise more money um, mm -hmm. for it. But, um, but that's another way if you can go direct to a distributor and the more uh, projects you have with that distributor and more um, you know, and and more notoriety um, and success with other with other things. I mean, the more likely you are to then for them to to fund you. But it's uh, it's still it's 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 really tough. I mean, they they want to see yeah. stuff. They want to know that you can do this, that you've delivered this kind of thing before. Um, so the straight to distributors, uh, you know, it's it's definitely an option, but it but it's also hard to do. Right. The, uh, you know, a side question on the flag factory thing. So how, how will Net Geo use a short like that? Will it play it online? Will it put it on the cable channel somehow? Shorts can be hard to program, I know, in broadcast wise. Right. Well, their big play um, is um, is awards. So mm -hmm. they're hoping that and my my co-director is an Academy Award winning director. So they're so it's not me, it's her that they're like banking on that um, you know, this can be um award driven. So um, I mean that's a big part of it. They're we're gunning for Sundance this year or Tribeca. And then um, they've already committed to doing an Oscar campaign and uh, you know, qualifying and stuff like that. So that's that's what. So, I mean, I think the last time they had, um, oh, what was that feature, the, the climbing one, uh, uh, Free Solo? Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, it's like they, they air it once or twice, you know, and mm -hmm. then, but now I think they have a deal with Hulu. So I think their, their stuff then goes to Hulu, but, um, but yeah, so it's, uh, they like to have the, their prestige category, I guess. Yeah, that's a good spot to be. Kat, I, just on the money front, it's a little bit different because you're not, raising money though your station has to, to to raise money but what what are what are your limitations on budget can you ask for money you know most of what you do probably is not terribly expensive but can you come up with a project that's going to cost something is there money for that yeah um, i haven't had to do that so far i mostly work as a one woman crew um sometimes with another with another videographer um but on the money front i was just going to say that you know if you have a strong local story definitely bring it to one of our green light meetings. I mean, 30 minute docs are our bread and butter. Um, and so we have green light meetings, you know, every couple months where we're just searching and searching and searching for local filmmakers with, with strong local stories. Um, and, you know, we're public media, so we're not HBO. We don't have, you know, millions lying around, but you know, there are, there are some resources available to, to help get stories going. So. And then does your station work with the, that filmmaker to, help the, them finish and then air that or, or yeah, um, it over the production or how does that work? Yeah, so it depends on what they're looking for. Um, so there's one coming up that somebody brought us just, you know, hours and hours and hours of footage that they've shot over the past, you know, 10 years or so about uh, the history of black gospel music um, in Kansas City, uh, but they didn't have the technical skills to put it together. So I'm probably gonna come on and, and finish editing that feature for them and turn that into a 30 minute doc. Um, sometimes people need um, a small crew or an audio engineer or just some funds uh, to finish out what they're working on. So it depends project to project, but yeah. Very good. Uh, well, speaking of crew, that kind of leads me into my next question, which is, uh, I think all of you have mentioned at some point, you know, hiring a editor, a cinematographer, a producer, or whatever it might be. What, what can you find in Missouri? And what do we have a shortage of? There would be people watching this who who do a lot of these jobs. So how do they find you and other 
people they can work with and what do you need uh, from them? Um, I can go first. Um, I think we've got, um, in terms of production, there's a lot here to um, tap into. Um, there's some really great cinematographers and there are some, um, and then just, um, you know, ACs and, um, and PAs. Um, but, um, and so I think on the production side, it, it's really, it's really good. And, um, there's a lot of options, but I think on the, on the post side, uh, I would love if Kansas city had more, um, like, a, like story producers, like people that can get things ready, ready for an edit. Um, and even like, uh, assistant editors, um, that were, that have done, and it's tough because like everybody does go to the coast because it's been a thing where you have to be together to, to do posts. But I think that if, um, you know, if we had a, a, some, some post talent here would be, would be really helpful for me. And how can they reach you? I mean, if somebody's watching this saying I'm an assistant editor, can they reach out to you? Do you want people to call you unsolicited or do you want to find them another way? Um, I, I mean, my email's out there. It's on my, it's on my website. Um, and I know that, um, you know, and the, the, the thing that I look for, um, is that people have had experience doing something that they've been on, um, you know, that they've either been done assistant editing for a show or for a film. Um, cause that's a really broad term to, to some people. So I do know that people are like, you know, I have edit experience, but they, they don't, you know, it's chicken or the egg. So, and, th and definitely there are people that we, that, um, uh, that, that can learn it and, you know, that they're, and, um, like some of my interns, I mean, they're the people I, that I trained and then I'll go back to them because I know that they, um, are, they know what I'm, what I'm looking for and what I need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chelsea, what about you? I know you talked about getting hired on into a number of these positions, but you must hire some people too. How do you find them or how do you want to find them? I never have any issue staffing my crew. Um, I have a very reliable network that you can find on the Tiny Attic website. They're basically my go-tos, but beyond that, I work with a, a huge amount of people just even based here in Columbia, Missouri on more fiction-based projects. Um, I, I've talked a little bit about cinematography and directing, um, but I'm, I'm also an editor. <laughs> That's one of the ways I keep my costs really low. Um, I've always edited all of my own projects. Um, I agree having a, a reliable editor that knows how to pull off your vision is, is tricky to find, but not impossible. Um, I'm also lucky that my, my cohort, Aaron Phillips, is a really strong editor as well. So we tend to pass the buck a lot. Um, I, I believe it was Mark Duplass said one of the most powerful tools for filmmaking is having really close friends that you feel comfortable enough sharing your work with while it's in process, knowing that it's in process. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I really feel like we have that here in our film community. Um, we'll often just have little like writers groups or get togethers where we were checking in with each other at various points of our production and weighing in and being like, ah, oh, that's, that idea is amazing. Keep going with that, but maybe scratch that other part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I feel very lucky in my film community for sure. Rock, what about you? Uh, you know, if you're back in Missouri or, or for that matter, would you hire Missouri talent in to some work someplace else? Or are you on the lookout for people? Yeah, I don't have like a really, I think, helpful answer necessarily. I, I tend to reach out to people that I know for recommendations for people that I need to hire anytime I need to hire people anywhere. Um, I, yeah, I wish there was like a good way to um, connect crew to people that need to hire them, but it just seems like it, it still happens very organically. Um, it, yeah, if I were if I were, were producing something and filming in like Washington State, for example, I would first start to think about who I know that has worked there or who I've met that that maybe lives there, has a connection there and reach out to them and get a recommendation for somebody who would then recommend somebody locally that they've worked with. That's kind of my instinct is to kind of go through personal connections and networks. And, um, and so that's also how I uh, how I would approach it in Missouri. I have hired people who live in Missouri to do jobs outside of Missouri frequently. And I, <laughs> but it's just people that I've worked with there that I really like and, and think are talented. And um, 
Yeah. Do, do all of you or any of you use LinkedIn or Facebook groups or anything like that? There's a number of Facebook groups for production jobs and things like that. Do you, yeah. do you routinely use those? The I did. Groups I do, yeah. Yeah, the Facebook groups, like I need a producer, or I need mm -hmm. an audio person, like the, the, there's those groups. Um, and usually that's when it's um, not in Kansas City, but sometimes, um, sometimes in Kansas City too. You might, I might have you type the in some of the ones you know, uh, type those into the chat so people can look those up. Kat, does um, Kansas City PBS hire freelancers for anything? Oh, yes, all the time. <laughs> we are really big on, on freelancers. Um, freelancers help a lot with all the projects that we do because we're pretty ambitious about what we what we put on our plates to do. So, yeah, always looking for freelancers. And how does it find those folks? Uh, a lot of times it's people that we've worked with before, uh, people that people know. Uh, but if you're in the Kansas City area um, and you're looking for freelance work, freelance work, I would love to help connect you to kind of widen our circle past just people that we immediately know too. All right. All right. So I'm going to ask one more question here. I think that'll take us till about 15 after the hour. And then um, we've got a few questions in the chat and we'll open up for some more to take us down to the, to the bottom of the hour. But I'm interested in what um, everybody's biggest frustration is with doing nonfiction work. If you had a magic wand to wave and fix a problem with the industry, what would that problem be? Gotta it would be nice. I, I, I know that um, it doesn't make any financial sense and that's why it exists this way. I mean, part of the problem I think in the, in the U.S. is that there's not really public money, very much public money for arts in general. And so it doesn't make a lot of financial sense for people to take a huge risk and put money into something before you have started a nonfiction project. Um, but that's the, the biggest hurdle, I think, to overcome is the fact that you have to put in either a lot of your own money or a lot of your own free labor um, to get a project to a point where you can then have something to show and to pitch and raise money for, for films or TV until you're very, very established. And then, you know, people can just believe in your ability to tell a story and give you money at, at the beginning. But yeah, that's that's a difficult part of, of the industry. We've seen a lot of filmmakers say, you know, that when the big streamers, Netflix and the other big streamers spend millions of dollars to buy a film, which is great for that filmmaker, but they wish they could just set aside a little bit of that money of sort of seed money to get films started or even finished in some cases, rather than just waiting till somebody scrapes and out grants, money and finishes it. Even the grants that exist for documentary films, there are very few that exist for like the beginning of the process. Like most grants, even you have to have a, a, a sizzle or a teaser or something to show, to submit. It's just, yeah. it's just a big some, rock to get over. Some track record. I know my students ask about, you know, is there some grants I can get to make my senior thesis film? I'm like, no, nobody's giving student filmmakers money. There's not enough money for the professionals. The students aren't getting any, any money like that. Yeah, and I would add to that, um, it, that's kind of a local frustration that I have is I do feel like Missouri and Kansas are the communities are not um, they're not as likely um, to give to film as they are to other arts and and I mean and I and the pot is small enough because you know getting people to give to the arts is is difficult but I feel like it's such a it's kind of a it's just, it's, it's a, you know, a horse of a different color or something where they just don't realize that the need or see the value as much as some, as some of the other arts. Because I know when I go through um, the grants and stuff that are available, or when I go to, um, you know, just even to some um, independent funding, um, they might be giving to, to dance and museums um, and theater, but, but film is, um, it just, it doesn't feel like we've, we've really cracked that nut here. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what that will take because, and I know this too, because we've been raising money for this um, film in Wisconsin and all around the country. I mean, I couldn't, I did, I raised some money from some people that I, that I, 
personally know in in Kansas City, but um, I had one pitch that got really close and it was several thousand dollars. Um, and then it didn't go through, but it was like, we're, we're getting large amounts from other parts of the country, um, but not but not in the Kansas City area. I would uh, say I, there's typically three routes I go through when I'm making a documentary. One, as I've mentioned, is the grant funding method, but that has significant drawbacks. Usually I have an oversight board uh, committee that I have to go through before the film is published, released to the, the public. and. Um, that has uh, led to some really fun situations where people try and script my my subjects, and I'm like, no, this is this is a documentary. This is what they said. You can't change the words coming out of their mouth. Uh, so that's a huge frustration on the grant funding side. Um, second, like everyone's mentioned, uh, I finance my own films. I I invest all of my own money up to a point, uh, hoping that it gets somewhere. And then, um, yeah, like. It, it's so tricky. The third route of just like, um, I would say it's almost like a reciprocity kind of like barter and trade method of making your film. Brock kind of mentioned it, but like being able to shoot in so many locations for free, having access, permissions granted, uh, travel expenses covered. I've made documentaries all over the world and typically I get a trade experience out of that. So they'll cover all of my, my travel costs. They'll cover like my room and board when I get there. Um, but, you know, I have to bring all the own, my, my equipment and, you know, staff the crew and we typically don't get a paycheck at the end of those shoots. So definitely the money is, is the most frustrating part because we, uh, at least me, I have to end up going to do commercial shoots in between the projects I really want to work on just to like, you know, pay the bills in between. Kat, anything from you? Yeah, I was going to kind of echo those same sentiments, especially what Brock said, you know, kind of lowering the barriers, the financial barriers to entry, um, especially for filmmakers of color. That's something that we talk about a lot in those circles is not having, you know, the ability to fall back on any kind of, on any kind of, you know, family support or, you know, generational wealth or anything like that in order to be able to work for free in a lot of situations. I mean, so, the, you know, there are times when you can make it work without that, but that's just, um, particularly a barrier that a lot of filmmakers of color face who want to in enter this industry, but it can be really, really financially inaccessible. So if I could change one thing, it'd definitely be that because there's a lot of talented people out there that can't quite make it work. Well, let me ask you about that because you're fairly new to the to the business here. And I know we talked about it in school that, you know, that how hard the money part of it was going to be. So why did you decide to go this direction? I'm sure you have lots of friends who might've done this and went for something a little more lucrative or at least more a better footing for the money. Yeah, I think, I don't think I would have been really satisfied doing anything else. Um, but also that's why I love being at Kansas City PBS because I had that security of a full-time job, but with like, you know, with a lot of the freedom to tell the stories that I get to choose um, and still and still be in that, in that film world. So. Uh, for me right now, it's, it's kind of the best of both worlds, but ultimately I, I don't think I'd be really happy doing anything else. The, um, the Report for America gig has a time limit on it, I think. You can renew once or something like that. So you, you will reach a yeah. point in a couple of years or something where it will end. So what direction do you see yourself going on? I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, right now I'm seeing, and you know, those kind of Facebook groups that we talked about, I see those those offers for, you know, assistant editor a couple months on the coast of France. Let me know if you're interested. And I'm like, oh God, <laughs> I wish I could take it. So, um, you know, I'm really happy where I'm at right now, um, but it just depends on, on what it looks like in a few years. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it, I guess. <laughs> All right, well, let's turn to some of our uh, audience questions here. I can see one in the chat I'll ask everyone here. So it says, this is from Bryce Young, who asks, a few people have mentioned it. If you have a completed piece to show or even a sizzle, is the key getting an agent if you don't have a ton of people to directly show your piece to? So Sharon, you were talking about agents before. And so advice on that? I think it's extremely valuable to have an agent um, because you can you can virtually pitch wherever you want to. Having said that, it's also, I know that it's really, really difficult to get an agent. So I think that, you know, my advice to people is when you, 
when you don't have an agent and this is maybe your first project or first couple of projects, um, what you really need to do is partner with someone who has, um, who has been in the industry and um, can be, can be basically executive produce your, pro your project or somehow collaborate with you. Um, and that's, that's sometimes difficult for people because when you first get into the industry and you have an idea, it's, um, you, you, have, you have to give up a lot to get that first connection. And chances are the first time you do something, you, you, you may not make any money on it. So you have to figure out like what your skills are that you can offer to, uh, to that production so that you can be part of it. And one of those things I think is what's really helpful is if you have unique access. If you have, if you have some unique access that nobody else has and you have a contract with someone who's going to allow you to film them and there's somebody really valuable, not just a good idea or somebody that you like, um, then then you you have something that you can take somewhere and you can partner with someone um, who will then help you to get who will likely have an agent and who can also can go to those buyers um, with the project. One thing I'll mention that I don't know um, I feel like not enough people know about these things, but there are some places you can apply with the project. If you have a teaser, if you're in the middle of something and you have something to show, one of them is in New York. Um, it was called IFP, but they changed the name to Gotham, the Gotham. They have a film week in September and it's all kinds of projects can apply in various stages, but it's essentially just kind of uh, speed dating of meetings. If you get accepted, you go to New York or like last year it was virtual. Um, but they set up all of these uh, meetings. And that's where I, I've been with through that with several projects. It's a week long in New York and you meet so many people. And that is where, like when we were doing the Taser documentary, I actually was there with a different project, a scripted project that we were developing that we filmed a couple years later. But I met um, Josh Braun of Submarine Entertainment who became our sales agent for the Taser documentary. Um, and we were meeting about another project, but then just kind of started talking about other things that we, that I was working on and that came up. And so that type of program is a great place to meet people. And then Film Independent um, here in Los Angeles has similar things. The Gotham and Film Week in New York is the best one, I think, because it's they take so many projects and all different kinds of projects. Um, the film independent programs out here, I think the projects have to be a little bit farther along, but there are, if you have a, a documentary that you're working on or whether it's a short, a feature or a series, there are several different programs you can apply to that um, like labs and uh, things that, that help connect you to people. Can I, I, I wanna add two things because you just made me think of, there's also Pitch Fest in, uh, in LA and that's kind of like that speed dating thing too. Um, yeah. And then you can also apply to New York Times like they, they're always looking for things. You can like apply directly to them. Oh yeah, Andrea mentioned podcasts they're doing even now at Gotham Film Week. Um, there are also like there's Camden Film Festival has a pitch uh, forum. There's one Hot Docs in Toronto has a pitch uh, forum. There's a lot of things that you can apply to to get in front of potential financiers and agents and, and other people. Yeah, great. That's a great answer. Uh, Andrew just told me before I got started that Missouri, the Missouri Film Office uh, is a, a sponsor of Gotham, so has connections there. Uh, let's see, another question here. Mindy Steinman Shaw would like to know, do you look for voiceover talent for your projects the same way as you look for other crew members? So I'm not sure how many people are using voiceover talent for any of their projects, but do you hire them the same way? Uh, I use voiceover actors all the time for uh, commercial gigs. Um, I cast from the local refugee community here for an animated doc project I did because the subjects um, who shared their stories did it in the confidence of therapy. Therefore, we did not want to uh, use their authentic narrative and had um, instead uh, a young man from, from the community here that understood their stories and represented um, kind of the, the collective uh, do their read over their their, their scripted parts. Um, yeah, uh, I, I usually 
uh, work with whoever I, I have connections with in whatever community I'm, I'm needing. Um, so uh, I haven't had to retreat to like Facebook uh, and just like uh, I, I, with Tiny Attic, I get emails every day from some voiceover actor asking <laughs> if I'm, I'm hiring right now. But um, usually it's it's either typecast from uh, people I've worked from worked with before or um, yeah, working with a direct community representative. It's so easy yeah. to hire voiceover actors, you know, from that you can be anywhere and it's um... And there are a lot of voiceover, uh, there's a lot of voiceover talent out there. I get emails a lot too from people that's just kind of sending their reels and stuff. It doesn't come up for me very often, but when it does, um, it's it's easy generally to just search uh, and find somebody online and hire them. All right, um, any, does anybody else you can speak up to? We can, this is, as I say, it's not a, webinar set up so we can see and hear you if anybody has a question they want to ask. We have a few minutes left before we go into the networking time. Anyone else have a question? If not, I've got a few uh, a few more I can ask here. Uh, I want to cut in before people do that. Okay. Well let me let me ask uh, ask another here. Um, I, this goes a little bit into what we talked about, but maybe some areas we didn't talk too much. What, what's your best advice for people getting their work seen, getting it in front of an audience, you know, one way or another? Is it better just to put it out there for free, go the festival route? What's the best way for people to get their nonfiction work seen? Um, I think all of it. I definitely think, I think festivals are, are great for, um, for you to get visibility, to meet other people in the community, um, and 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 also to sell your sell your work. So I think that I think festivals are great. I think that sometimes um, if something doesn't go somewhere, putting it online is kind of a good idea. Um, so people can start seeing it. It might go viral. People might start you know looking at it. Um, especially like I know people are doing like short web like little web series of their own to just put their work out there so that people can see it. I think that's um, a really good idea. You put the Gnomist out online, I feel like fairly quickly after you finish it, I don't, but I can't remember its whole lifespan, but I felt like that was online fairly early, right? Um, well, I, yes, and that was because uh, it premiered at Tribeca and CNN picked it up at Tribeca. Okay, it was CNN, okay, yeah. yeah. That was and then they put it online. Um, yeah. And then it got, yeah, and they started it with, uh, they launched it with Great Big Story. Um, and then it got 17, 17 million views um, it, over a few years. So that was, uh, and it's crazy because a short online may have more views than anything else that I right. have done. Is that still at CNN? Where can people see well, that? Well, it's interesting because CNN sort of, the great, great big story went away. And so my licensing agreement with them went away and they've just contacted me because they're developing something else, but it, it's still out there. I, I didn't, and this is like uh, a decision I made that nobody's paying for it. It's, mm -hmm. or somebody's getting ad money for, for it. I have no idea who, but I don't want to take it down. So I don't right. want to, I, you know, so I'm leaving it out there. And then, um, but CNN has just contacted me again to renegotiate. So I think they have some new platform that they want to put it on. Uh, I just, somebody asked, I just put it in the chat here. So it's called, it's hard when we say it, the no mist, you can see yeah. it spelled out there. Uh, but yeah, so maybe if people Google it, they can find it to watch somewhere. It's it's terrific. It might make you cry. I'll warn you, but uh, you can you can watch that. I think you can find that out there. Uh, we just got a few minutes left. Uh, what what you, a lot of you have talked about what we could see. So Sharon, you mentioned the Flag Factory and Nat Geo. Anything else that we might see of yours soon? Um, I do have a project um, that is at Stars, um, and this is maybe interesting just because of how the development works that I I, get, I had a sizzle, took it out to different places, STARS was interested in it, so then they made it a development deal with me um, to do more, um, to give them like casting reels of who, who would be in it, and then to write out a treatment of like what each episode, it's a six part documentary series, it's kind of a, it's sort of crime um, and religion related, um, and uh, and I'm actually waiting to hear back because I am hoping 
but who knows, you know, they have everything they need to make their decision and it could take six months. They could also never pass and just leave it sitting there. So you never mm-hmm. know. Uh, Kat, your work, I assume is all online for the station. Anything you direct us to look at that you're particularly proud of? Uh, Yeah, so our housing coverage, we do a lot of videos there. Um, And so I've been really embedded in the unhoused community in Kansas City. Uh, And so we have uh, a lot of videos through Flatland KC. That's our digital magazine. That's where most of my video work is. So if you're interested in some some short documentary style videos about uh, Kansas City's housing issues and unhoused population, check that out. I'll put that in the in the chat as well. Brock, what, what do you have out there that we might be able to see? Or what do you have um, I saw that Andrea put all of our, I think, websites in the yeah. chat, but boxcarfilms.com is my website. And I think all of the, the films that I've done are listed there um, and they're available to see in various ways because it kind of changes all the time. I was looking up a film the other day that was on Amazon Prime, but now it's not anymore, but I think it's on Hulu. Some of the distributors, like it's just always constantly changing, um, but all of them are on my website and I they're all available to find somewhere. Chelsea, what about you? What do you have uh, that we might look at or that you have coming out soon? So uh, the film I've mentioned about the woman uh, becoming a mother, um, working title right now, she, the creator, it's a line from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is actually a heavy theme throughout uh, my subject's experience with her herself becoming a mother. Um, and uh, I, so I've been spending a, a week uh, locked in a cabin every summer since starting this film, processing my footage, uh, and I'm about to dive in very heavily to the final stages of post-production. So I can't say for certain when that will get distributed um, or even finished edited, but I'm very excited about that project whenever <laughs> it gets completed. Um, and then I, I have a few other things I'm pretty excited about, but I'm unfortunately under uh, some NDAs and I, I can't discuss them in detail, but uh, I am doing an animated uh, component to a, a doc TV series. So uh, right. that'll be coming out sometime <laughs> eventually. Well, we'll look forward to that. As Brock said, all of your um, websites are in the chat so people can grab those to, as a way to to see your work or contact you if they want to do that. Um, I thank everybody for coming to be part of the panel, Um, getting up early or really early on a Saturday and and devoting your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, Good for the the cause here in Missouri. So we appreciate that. Um, Our panel is welcome to stick around. They may have other things they have to do for our networking time. Andrew, do you want to take over and set up the networking time or Sure. This was great. I want to thank you guys too. I learned a lot. I I feel um, encouraged and inspired and I hope all of you have um, also felt that way. And I hope you'll stick around for a few more minutes. If you do want to go, we'll ask you to go ahead and um, log off so that you don't get accidentally put in a (laughs) breakout room. Before you go um, next month, we're going to talk about distribution. And we have a producer who has had several films distributed in his move back to Missouri from Los Angeles and we're going to do more of a workshop like we did with the finding financing where we're going to get to the nitty-gritty of distribution and and hear some of those things that you don't always hear on these kinds of panels Um, so come back next month um, August 24th will be the next one and then if everybody wants to stick in here I'm going to put us in breakout rooms for about 15 minutes so if you'll introduce yourselves around there's going to be five people in three rooms and then we usually throw out a a first question um, maybe be what any nonfiction work that you're working on right now. How about that? So here we go. We're going to magically go into some breakout rooms and I'll see you back in 15. Thanks everybody. Did it work? Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Just me.